Forum G2. Geopolityka i gospodarka. Więcej informacji na www.forumg2.com All right, good morning. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this session. Thank you also to the organization for having us here. Um, my name is Martijn van Delde. Uh, I work for Amazon on a project called Project Kuiper, based out of London. Uh, and my responsibility is I look after the business strategy for the project in Europe. So go to market strategy, planning, uh, and strategic partnerships. A few weeks ago, I had uh, a moment of clarity. Um, I'm a big fan of basketball. Uh, I love watching the NBA. And usually I don't get to see the, the games because they're in the middle of the night. A few weeks ago I was able, I was on a business trip, I had to leave very early, and I was able to actually watch the game on my phone. Enjoying it, it was a very intense game, very tight game. And then the connection dropped. Uh, and my initial response was I got very frustrated. Uh, and that's when a moment of clarity happened. First moment of clarity was I need to change my mobile provider. Second moment of clarity was, look at how privileged I am. I can watch a game being played in the US on a phone in a moving car. Loads of people in the world today don't have access to any of that. If you look at globally, the number of people that are defined as having uh, unserved and underserved communities, people without reliable connectivity, we're talking about some of the numbers, some of the studies differ, but up to 2.9 billion people without, ex without access to any of those services that we completely take for granted. If you dig into those numbers, you see that there's a billion people, households, with no fixed broadband. There's 300 million underserved households that are working on old technologies that may not give them the speeds and their interactive capabilities to enjoy the types of services we, uh, we, we enjoy. There's 100 million business endpoints, public sector endpoints, that lack the same connectivity. And we know this has a massive impact. We know this has impact to GDP. Uh, we know it has access to health, people being able to get health services. Um, access to, 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 to connectivity helps us with connecting schools. It has a massive impact. So when we looked at it as Amazon, it was quite clear what our mission had to be. Um, Project Kuiper. Uh, it says it on the slide, is a service that will be connecting these underserved and unserved regions. We will be delivering a fast and affordable broadband service. Fast means quick enough to enjoy the types of interactive services that we currently uh, enjoy. And affordable. Um, we're not the first satellite constellation. Most likely we won't be the last. Affordability has always been the breaking point. To connect the truly unconnected, you need to get your cost down as far, as far as you can. And I'll be speaking a bit about how we plan to do that. In terms of the project, um, we'll be launching 3,236 satellites. Those satellites will be launching through LEO orbit, which is the, uh, a low Earth orbit, so close to the, close to the globe. Um, and we'll be operating in KA band, and I'll get a little bit into what that means and why we chose that. We are a part of Amazon, uh, and at Amazon we pride ourselves on being very customer-obsessed. Um, we take customer needs, we work backwards to solutions. We actually internally start with uh, a, a, an initial PR announcement to say this is the value you want to bring to customers, and we use that to work back towards what needs do they have, what requirements do they have, do we, what do we need to design. So that's forefront of everything we do. Next up we have a passion for invention. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing with the design of both the satellites and the antennas. We have a commitment to operational excellence, which if you have prime delivery, a lot of people globally uh, you know, have access to the next day or, or within two days delivery via the Amazon platform. And we have long-term thinking. We tend to say that we are okay with being misunderstood for a long time, as long as what we deliver in the end brings true customer value. So how are we applying that to Kuiper? Let's start with the customers and work backwards from there. We see three main uh, customer groups. First being residential. So for us, residential is individual households, people living in houses needing a connection, and as well, small businesses. Small businesses, one or two people can't necessarily afford the types of enterprise services, so we have that in our residential segment. The residential segment is a shared uh, bandwidth connectivity segment, just like you see in terrestrial services. So it's a broad pipe that we use to service loads of different customers at the same time. 
Our second segment is enterprise. Um, and there's two main items here. It's B2B, it's all kinds of mobility solutions, and it's telco backhaul. Um, we're planning to be an ISP of sorts. We're not planning to be an MNO. We do see us playing a role in helping MNOs reach full 5G coverage globally. Um, this won't be a shared bandwidth solution. So for enterprise and for government, we'll bring a what we call a committed information rate service. So we'll design links specifically for the end users and we'll make sure we manage things like quality of service and, and the associated SLAs in terms of bandwidth, uptime and availability. The third group is governments. Um, this would be of the public sector, but also uh, departments dealing with critical information uh, in infrastructures. Um, we can serve schools, we can serve hospitals, but we can also help with real-time data in case there's a fiber cut, or we can provide resilience if there's, if there's any incidents. We can help out, for instance, if there's something like we recently saw in Turkey with the earthquake there. Satellite broadband is ideally suited to be rolled out very quickly and can respond much quicker than terrestrial solutions can be. So we also see a role. We can see the value we can add in that sector as well. So how are we different? Ah, it comes up. So there's four key items that we're building this on, four key differentiators. And I'll get into the details. The four are performance, scale, affordability, as I mentioned before, and flexibility. So let's look at performance first. Um, we made a couple of choices. So the first, the first key strategic decision we took is to operate in Leo band. Traditional satellite operators uh, in, in legacy designs have operated in geo. Geo is synchronous with the Earth. That means it's fur it needs to be further away to achieve that. And it means that the time it takes to travel from the Earth to the satellite and back is quite long. It's 600 to 800 milliseconds round trip. That blocks you from having true interactive services. If we want people to enjoy the same types of services that we enjoy today, we know that we need to bring down the latency. So the first choice we made was really to go into a LEO orbit. We will be able to provide 30 to 50 millicents round trip latency. Um, what that means, uh, apologies, for some reason I am using the wrong set of slides, which is terrible. And this one is not, for some reason it's not sharing. Can anyone help with the, I don't know what the laptop is doing on the screen. Ah, there we go. Yes, back on track. Apologies for that. So let's get back to why latency matters. So latency is all about interactive services. So for consumers, that means you'll be able to FaceTime with your family if they're remote. Um, it, will be able, it means you'll be able to do gaming. You'll be able to enjoy interactive gaming services. Um, for corporate workers, it means the lovely Zoom calls and the web calls and the MS team calls that we got to enjoy during COVID will actually be hosted and we'll be able to interact um, in real time with our direct colleagues. For enterprise, it means um, good connectivity for transportation, high frequency trading, all kinds of services that require an interactive service we'll be able to, uh, to support. It also means that when lives are, are at stake, we can give you real time data. You get what is happening on the ground immediately as it happens. So we believe that is a key, latency is a key driver to the performance that Kuiper will be able to deliver. The second is about performance in terms of the network. So what we're building is, a, is a, an extended network, not only in the, in the sky with the 3,200 satellites, but also on the ground. We'll be installing a number of hundreds of gateway stations across the globe, and we'll be connecting them with an extended ground network. That ground network will be directly tied into the AWS network. So, one, that allows us to optimize latency also on the ground, because AWS is already set up for that. Two, we've been able to build a software-defined network. So we'll get to sort of the, the uh, network design, but basically our gateways are connected to point of presence. In the point of presence, we have the Kuiper software-defined network, which will continuously monitor and optimize performance. When you talk about traffic management, when you talk about uh, congestion, we'll be constantly seeing what's happening, and we have the ability to reroute traffic where, and where we see fit. For those of you that are familiar with KA-band, KA-band is high frequency. It is susceptible to rain. 
we've built in redundancy both on the ground with our gateways and we're operating at three different altitudes. So if someone is impacted by rain, we can either route traffic to a different gateway or we can point the antenna to a different inclination and therefore reduce the impact. All of that will be managed by our software-defined network. Let's talk about the second differentiator, so scale. Um, there's two parts. There's the coverage and the amount of capacity. Um, this is an animation. It's just an indication of what we'll do. Um, we'll start launching satellites, as you see on the, on the left part here. Um, as we roll out, um, we cover up to 56 north, 50, 56 degrees south, and we're launching from south and north onwards. So where you see here, there's no coverage yet. We will then launch from the top and the bottom. This is where service starts. In the end, we'll be able to uh, cover everything between 56 north and south. What that means is that we're able to cover 95% of the world's population with this constellation. Um, for those that have looked into the FCC findings, we have filed for polar coverage. So that means the, the two lagging parts. It's part of our filing. We're evaluating if that is something we need to get into. The initial phase will be this, and it covers 95% of the globe. The second part of scale is our capacity. 3,200 satellites on KA band. KA band has a lot of frequency. Combined with a number of uh, gateway stations means we'll have a ton of capacity. Um, I'm unfortunately not able to externally share the total amount of capacity the system will generate. But ever having worked in seven to 10 years in the satellite industry, I can share that this, the amount of capacity this system will generate is something I personally have never worked with. Um, that means something else as well. It means that the cost of designing, manufacturing, and launching satellites is spread over more capacity. So if we're able to monetize and use that capacity, we can really drive down the cost per megabit. So I said before, a big blocker for people to enter into these types of services is the cost. By having this amount of capacity, this amount of satellites, we can bring down the cost per the megabit that we serve, the link that we provide, which leads us to a better affordable service. Secondly, we're designing our own customer terminals. Um, recently, at the C DC SAT show, we announced these three, um, which we're very proud of, by the way. Um, the middle one is our standard terminal. Um, it's about the size of a laptop, to make it a bit more relatable. Um, this can give us up to 400 megabits of downlink speed. That's more than enough for an individual household. It can also serve uh, remote cell towers in less depopulated areas. The production cost of that antenna, the middle one here on the slide, is below $400. Um, we believe that for enterprises looking to connect set our backhaul, that's a really good solution. We also think we can drive the total cost of ownership between the capacity and the terminal to an acceptable price point for individual households. Should that not be enough, we're also working on the ultra compact uh, antenna here on the left. I cannot share the production cost externally yet. I can share that it will be below that of the standard. The size of this one is roughly the size of an iPad, so we're quite, quite comprehensible. The bigger one here is our enterprise solution. It's 80 by 50, let's say it's the size of a poster on the wall. Um, that one is for enterprise services. It's full duplex and can go up to one gigabit. If you look at long-term goals of connectivity by the FCC, by EU, or by the Polish broadband uh, program, the one gigabit service is what people are targeting to reach, and we believe that satellite broadband can play a role in achieving those goals. And the affordability of these terminals, again, combined with the, with the amount and therefore cost of capacity, we feel is a real differentiator. So then the last one is flexibility. So this is the overall network design. On the left side here, you see the customer, uh, customer terminals with the different types of services or customers we're looking to, to serve. That obviously goes up to the satellite, satellite goes down to the gateway, and then the gateway goes to what I mentioned before, this point of presence. In the point of presence is where the magic happens, for, for lack of a better word. So this is where we route traffic, this is where we have the software-defined network, this is where we continuously update and manage the system. And we're flexible in two ways. One, we're flexible in where the interconnect is, so we're, we can bring the data back to a third-party uh, enterprise service provider, of networks, we can bring it back to the public internet, or we can link it to the types of cloud services that AWS, for instance, provides. So flexibility is really around network design, landing points of the capacity, um, and also the, the types of gateways that we use. So we, we're flexible to work with governments and enterprises to really say, where do you want to land your traffic? How you want the network to look? What level of private networking do you want? What level of autonomy? What level of protection do you want? That's really our flexibility. 
So those are the four key differentiators. I briefly want to touch on safety and sustainability. Uh, we get questions, hey, look, there's other LEO operators. They're launching thousands of satellites. You're launching thousands of satellites. How will that impact uh, you know, visibility? Will it be safe to, to launch uh, going forward? So we do two things. One, in terms of uh, reflection of the satellites, we're working with international communities to stick to the order of seven magnitude reduction of reflection. Uh, and secondly, because we're close to the Earth and the satellites are all fitted with propulsion engines, we'll do active deorbiting um, once after, a year after lifetime. Where, where, that, where we can't do that, the uh, satellites will passively deorbit within 10 years. So uh, for those that are more familiar with LEO, LEO satellites have a shorter lifespan than traditional GEO satellites, which means you have to continuously keep launching. We'll make sure that deactivated satellites will be deorbited and we're completely uh, working with the international communities and all kinds of space traffic regulations. So that's Kuiper. Let's look at what that can mean for Poland. Um, so this is just taken from um, uh, the, 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 the central EU website. I'd love to learn more about specific goals you have. But if you look at the goals here, I think they're completely aligned with our mission. You're talking about universal access to 100 megabits. We've designed our smallest, most cheapest terminal to be able to provide that service. You're talking about getting to one gigabit of connectivity for social economic drivers. We've designed our enterprise terminal to be able to provide up to a gigabit of service. You're talking about 5G connectivity. Again, we won't be an MNO, but we will be an ISP provider or a backhaul provider to MNOs to make sure that they get their 5G, 5G rollout done on time. And we actually think we can help with speeding up the timelines because the deployment of satellite terminals is quicker than digging and putting fiber cables in the ground. We also see that there's a specific program about connecting schools. Again, we believe we can play a role there, and we'd love to engage with everyone in the business and government community on how best to serve these types of, uh, these types of applications. So I think there's a shared vision, vision here, and I think we're really well set up to help you achieve these goals. It's also a natural evolution of what Amazon has been doing in Poland so far. Prior to 2013, we started our research, we started our engagement. In 2013, we bought Ivona Software, we opened a research center. We followed that up with uh, opening three fulfillment centers in Poland. By now, that's gone up to 10, so we have quite a presence here. Um, we launched Amazon.pl, so our, our website, in 2021. We continued that growth with then launching Amazon Web Services with a local zone in Warsaw. And we're continuously looking to add more value to the Polish economy and the Polish, uh, Polish consumers. Um, I'm going to keep you waiting a little bit. So it says upcoming Kuiper launches in Poland. I'll talk a little bit about our overall schedule uh, two slides after. Just wanted to show this. For me, this is the summary of it all. We have fee four key uh, differentiators. Performance in terms of latency. Performance in terms of our software-defined network traffic management. We have scale. We cover 90% of the globe. We have uh, a load of capacity to sell to really serve people that need connectivity. That capacity helps us to be affordable. We're combining that with a terminal that is, that is affordable. And then lastly, we're flexible in terms of network design and overall traffic routing. So I hope I've gotten you interested. Um, you may be thinking, OK, fine, but when are you actually launching? So this is our overall key milestones plan. Back in 2022, we secured over 80 satellite launches. You can build the best possible network, the most brilliant satellites, if you can't get them up. We can't provide service. Um, in 2023, it's very exciting for us. We're launching our first two prototype satellites. Those satellites have been built. They're ready to be launched. We're waiting for ULA to be ready. Once that's done, it will allow us to completely test our end-to-end -end link. We've done all that testing, obviously, in labs, etc. But it allows us to have a real-life example, tangible example, of our complete end-to-end -end service. We'll start launching production satellites in 2024. This means we can start demos by the end of 2024. We'll have different demo locations where people can test the service uh, and really experience it. And then our commitment uh, in our filings with the FCC is to have 50% of our satellites launched by mid-2026. This means by then we'll have global coverage. And in 2029, again, per our FCC filings, uh, we're committed to have all the satellites launched. As you've seen, we start with the rollout uh, in North America and the north of Europe. Poland is geographically suited to be one of the first to launch. Um, can't give exact dates, but we're expecting to be ready sort of second half of 2025. Um, and in between then and now, 
Um, we'd love to invite you for questions. We'd love to speak to you. We'd love to talk about different business models, partnerships, anything that, that you uh, are interested in. Um, please ask and please, um, yeah, let's, let's make this work together. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you were to compare Project Kuiper to your main competitor, Starlink, mm -hmm. yeah. what would be the main advantage that you would see? Maybe a part of the sanity of the owner. <laughs> well, that's one. Um, we're, consistently, we're really dedicated to affordability, so we believe we can get to a, a system that is more uh, affordable for end consumers, that's one. Two, um, as I said, we're providing committed information rates to enterprises, so it will be more reliable for both enterprises and governments in terms of the service. And then three, uh, we're not just dropping off the, 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 the um, traffic at the public internet. We're dropping it off at the AWS point. We can set private networking, so the security of our systems, again, specifically for enterprises and, and, and governments, we believe are three key differentiators towards the existing uh, LEO-based satellites. And are you aiming, aiming for market share mostly in enterprise sector or the household and the other sectors that you have provided on the first slide? Across all functions. So it's really all the, all the three that we listed. Uh, we really want to connect as many people as we can and have them join this, this global economy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask about um, the plan to cover like 95% of of, of the globe and the population isn't actually dependent on particular countries somehow to let you or not to prevent you from working there or since the satellites are let's say uh, above the um, the authority of the states and mm -hmm. it's simply to buy a device it's somehow like neutral so it cannot be postponed in in, in other words, could it be that some of the countries, continents, will not be covered because somehow authorities do not let like such business in? Yeah, so in, in terms of coverage, we need to launch the satellites anyways and they'll keep flying, so coverage, yes. Country access is, is something we're working on. We have Nina here who works on our regulatory team and our regulatory team globally is working very closely together with all the regulatory bodies, um, one to gain you know, to get approval for the licenses we need to operate, but also is really looking into making sure we comply with all kinds of local rules, whether it be about data localization, uh, whatever, whatever is required. So um, we're, we're on that journey. Um, I think, I don't have the latest stats, but we're, we're, we're doing well in terms of uh, getting access and we're working very closely together with governments and regulatory bodies and we want to make sure we're a good actor in terms of uh, filing and making sure we get, we get country access and that we comply with all the local laws. Okay, so if I can, another question. Um, uh, you showed actually the, the ready business plan, yes, from technical side, customer, market, so it's like a, uh, something uh, done. And do you have any kind of potential further development of, of Project Kuiper, meaning like, like getting into like new technology or like new uh, problems to be solved uh, after 2030. So it's like, um, I don't know, my first guess is like uh, uh, over 3,000 satellites there and for instance, I know solar wind could like uh, destroy all of them. Mm -hmm. So maybe you are already s somehow involved in working in the technology to improve that. Do you have any such like scenarios so, uh, so, for uh, more than 10, 15 years already? So our initial focus is making sure that we deliver on the initial promise. Uh, so our engineers are, are, are super focused on making sure we meet our timelines, making sure the system performs. But yes, we do have people obviously thinking more longer term and speaking to external partners. Uh, not something I can share at the moment, but it, yeah, we're definitely looking into that.